May we now request the presenters, are they still here, uh, Lorraine, Alvin, to join us in the, on the stage. Uh, together with uh, three other reactors, first of whom is uh, Ed Francisco, a very active uh, person in governance, a former uh, trustee of ICD, now president and CEO of BDO Capital. We also would like to invite to the stage uh, Mr. Delphine Wenceslau, CEO of the um, Wenceslau and Associates. <clears throat> and uh, okay, and then. Uh, Last but not the least, least among the reactors is uh, imported from Cebu, uh, Franco Soberano. Uh, the father of Franco and uh, myself were together with uh, Ayala Land many years ago, and uh, our team uh, spearheaded the expansion of Ayala Land in Visayas and Mindanao. It was a pleasure working with Joe. For the open discussion, there are microphones on the floor for your use in directing questions or speakers. Uh, Sheriffville trustee Romy David. Is Romy here? Yeah, okay. We'll make sure that the open discussion is in order. Uh, please be brief in asking your questions and refrain from making a speech. We are now ready for your questions. Take it away, Josh. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, first request from the moderator, please put down all your cell phones. Or turn it on uh, silent mode. Anyway, I think it is a very uh, good presentation. And uh, more than anything else, uh, I've been listening to Joe Shaw for quite some time now. He was also our Phoenix CFO of the year. And it's always a learning experience to listen to him. So firstly, uh, I think you have somebody will start off the questioning. But there are certain things that you have to know. I was rather close with, uh, in the past with Alvin, Lau, and Lorraine. And you must know that the uh, IPO of DNL was done on December 12, 2012. So those of you who are familiar with that's critical. Also to tell you that uh, a very simple uh, investment guideline I learned from the father of, of Alvin. When DNL was floated at 4.30, in five years time it went up to even 23. So at one time, we had a meeting. He says, Josh, for it to go double, very simple, no? For it to go double, it has got to go to 43. So for 43 to double, it's got to go 86. What do we do? I said, we do a stock split. But Albin did better. They had enough retained earnings and they declared 100% stock dividend. So it went down to 10. So you don't know that when you're buying at 10, it's actually 20. Right? So you can continue to buy at 10 before we do another stock split. I mean, they do another stock split. Okay, I see somebody who stood up there uh, for the first question. Sir, you, Romy? Go ahead. No. Uh the floor is now open for questions, actually, uh, but maybe the, to give the opportunity to the reactors to also to comment first uh, before we go to the open forum, if we may. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I think we saw here a, uh, a significant shift, and I think uh, uh, one thing for sure, we saw 
uh, that professionalizing the organization was one of the key points uh, uh, that was brought up. Uh, maybe we can hear from the uh, reactors uh, how they view the uh, efforts of the various... Uh, would you like to do it according to age or uh, <laughs> north to south? So maybe, Ed, Ed, maybe you know, how did you start off? Sorry, what was... Okay, um, in my case, as I, I guess as a reactor, I've had the luxury of working with the three, three uh, at the companies of the three presenters anyway. My experience, at least my insight, is that of course they had all the great presentations, but they, they were, they were, there really were two stress levels. The first stress level is when you're doing the IPO, it happened with, no, in fact, it happened with these five people, not just these three, because I worked with also with Bods and, 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 with, and with Franco. But the first stress they have is when they, if they have to decide, they have to convince themselves, right? That's something that the, 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 higher, the, the owner or the principal, the chairman has to decide has to convince, discuss with the children. Sometimes it's the children who wants it, sometimes it's the father or the mother. So that's the first stress. Once they finally decide to do that, the second stressor also really is that, frankly, let's say in their case, they're still running their businesses. But you have to do now, you have to have a work team to do the IPO and that can take any time between three months to two years, depending on the housekeeping. So they have to keep their eye on the ball and yet they have to deliver their business, grow their targets, and then they have to work on this IPO, which is taking so much time. And then, and then as I think one of the things that I got from their presentations was that if the, once you do the IPO, the work is not done. It's actually just the start because that's when they have to deliver on the results. They have to do active IR. And Alvin and Lorraine talked about it, how good they are. And, and even Joe talked about going team having to go once a year around the world. So you, you rack up the mileage points, but it's very tiring, I'm sure. But that's where the challenge is also now bringing in the professionals and now managing the business, but managing expect, investor expectations. So that's the challenge. There are many stress points and maybe it's, yeah, later on. Uh, it would be interesting to find out from them, you know, which of these three or three or even more stress points in their careers of their companies were the hardest to manage and how they're managing that. But that's my initial reaction so far. Maybe I'll pass the floor to Sure. sure. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, it was uh, mentioned that my father had a different track. He started as, uh, he started the corporate world, uh, learned a lot from Ayala. Uh, for him, life big. His uh, 50 was like a, a thir his equivalent of a 30-year-old. No, but uh, he brought that professionalism with him uh, and into his entrepreneurial venture in his 50s. Uh, he started his company in 2003 uh, and then IP IPO'd just 14 years into the company. And I guess what was very important was uh, the founder was very open-minded to the next generation. So. It was uh, that next generation uh, uh, bringing in all these new ideas and practices, uh, which I feel was very important. And so I, I, I smiled very hard when uh, Mr. Joe said, from one C to six C, Cs, uh, ours also, one soberano to uh, six soberanos uh, helps a lot. And uh, all of us were trained uh, uh, by very entrepreneurial parents, so we brought that work ethic. Uh, that professionalism to the company and we had to earn earn our position in the company yeah hi um i think uh, the story is actually very similar at least for dmy just now for us and with alvin and Lorraine and even with francos so um we are my generation is actually the third generation um but that being said even though we're the third generation this is the time that we actually saw that there was going to be an immense um, or we could foresee that there was going to be growth for the company and considering that you know from my grandfather to my dad to the four to me and my four siblings to the next 11 um, four generation we we wanted basically to make sure that the um, succession and the corporate governance was there um, obviously you know um, I, I think I, I talked a little bit with uh, with Joshua here you know so we, we were talking about you know the timing and everything you know actually you know when we were because people have asked me why we were why we were still going in this market but you know um, at least for us when we were 
going through this process, we had no idea that you know, the market was going to go in this way. But at the same time, we were very confident at the value that we left on the table. And, we're, and that's still our position right now. Um, obviously, it's a bit bittersweet because, uh, as you know, the markets uh, went down further. Actually, we were joking because the week after the listing, it's, uh, it was actually my father's uh, 75th birthday. And we were joking, baka, baka walang pumunta. Oh. But, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we, we go into this uh, process. It's something that we take seriously as a family and as a company. And uh, moving forward, we're, we're still confident about the, the value that we're, we're giving to the shareholders. There are uh, many families, uh, family business still around that are on the verge of making that decision. Uh, was, what was the key stress point? Because uh, to, to give up a uh, proprietor, proprietary type uh, management and shift to a professional group of people is a major shift for many, many people. Uh, was it difficult uh, or what were the key motivators to get you to look in, uh, at having an IPO? No? Which I think your major investors would like to see a more professionalized uh, uh, management team. You want to take a cut that, Alvin? Uh, may I just request the slides because they're blinding me. In two minutes, I will not be able to see anymore. <laughs> can, can you have that shifted? To okay, heaven. Ano lang yung uh -huh. ilaw, uh, or turn it off. Okay, good. Now I can see all of you. Thank you. Um, so for us, the decision to do the IPO and before that decision to start hiring professionals to help us learn, it was really, uh, no, uh, we wanted to help, we wanted to help learning best practices first and we didn't want to um, start from the beginning. We wanted to hit the ground running. Uh, we also found a lot of value uh, because relying on other people, uh, it was actually us admitting that we didn't know everything, we couldn't do everything ourselves, and we really needed help. Um, at the end of the day, we have a lot of family members working in the business, but uh, we, we do have a lot of very good people helping us, and we need to rely on them more. Uh, so that was the impetus why we hired a lot of people from outside. Um, for us, it was very strategic. Obviously, raising funds um, to fuel our growth was the major consideration. So as we were building out our pipeline of developments within the Bay, Manila Bay Area, you know, we'd, we would always obviously fund it with debt and with um, equity. And that equity came, at least for us, with selling our land. So as the land keeps going up every year, it was going up 20% year in year growth. We just wanted to make sure that we weren't sacrificing our, our long-term growth with short-term growth. And we felt that the, at the time, we felt that the equity markets were, was our best um, option for fueling our short-term growth. Lorraine, you wanna take a crack at that? Uh, being the young one, well, so Medro Young, the no the company being public one ish years um our stance or our our experience with our company we're kind of we're, we're a little bit into into the culture change or the culture ch uh, shift between being a privately held company to being a publicly held company um we're very careful to really let our people know that they're there we're we're in it together we're not here to like take you out. I think a lot of people may be thinking that, okay, we're public, we have to be professional, we have to take out the, you know, the ones that aren't, uh, that used to be in the private, you're not really uh, working for us. It's not that way for us. We, we want to look at our complement of leadership and whatever we don't have or we need expertise on, then we augment. So that's, that's the way we, we look at things. We balance it. Joe? You want to expand on that? Well, I, I guess uh, from a private, privately held company, before we go into public, there were some concern uh, the family that uh, they will lose control, 
uh, that they would somehow lose, you know, the, the their effort to grow a business, etc. But to me, it has been proven that you hire the right people. As I said, trust is number one. Don't go for Harvard graduate. They are not all good. <laughs> but trust people, they are all good. So the family, the first criteria is trust. Second is don't be afraid to hire high paid people if they can deliver. In other words, hire the right people, pay them well, because these are the people that will deliver and help you out. With the right people, that pressure will be done. Many people are asking me, Joe, how do you manage this conglomerate being the chairman? I said, why should I manage? There are a lot of good people down there. I just smile, I just go around, I just shop around, and then if there is problem, and that executive cannot change, cannot manage, change them. That will make your life easy. Thank you very much. Uh, any question from the floor? Maybe we can have one. For we have there, uh, I think this one. Follow through ko lang, Joe. Sinay mo magagaling na yung six C's that followed. Do you see the third generation taking over also? Uh, we are now... We are now have the office, as you know, in... Uh, uh, what's that? Loxin Building. That's the... Beside your office in PLD2. And uh, we own... Nine floor out of the 14 floors. And on top of that building, we have a family office. Where I am considered being the eldest, being the referees. And one of my major tasks is how to cultivate the third generation. There are 18 of them. 18. We accept not all of the 18 would like to be where we are. In fact, to them, sira ulo, tatrabaho, mahami namang pera, no pag-abod yan. Okay, if that is the lifestyle they want, so be it. Some of them wants to be a writer. Fine. You should not force them if they don't like. Because that will be short term. Long term is you get excellency for people who do the job that they like. So there are some good third generation that we are cultivating right now. Not sending them to Harvard, to JP Morgan, to <laughs> Wala mangyari. Go down the road. Be a packer. Punta ka dyan sa supermarket, makita mo yung sum of the third generation, nagpapak. Train them, train them, train them. To see. Train them from the beginning so that they move up, they know the whole culture. Uh, they know the whole culture. That's how we, who was the question? Third generation. Yes. Thank Thank you, thank you. And Any questions see, from the floor? We are looking at also professional people. That, number one, trust. Um, that can help the third Mr. generation. Mr. Parungao? Yes. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to ask this uh, question of Ms. Lorraine and Mr. Alvin. Your presentations are very good, but uh, my question is, um, if you had to do it all over again, what would you have done differently? Beauty queen uh, question. <laughs> Beauty queen. Beauty queen.
Um, you know, honestly, uh, I don't think we would have done anything differently. Um, let me explain that. When we listed in 2012, uh, our mentality was that we were listing a manufacturing company. Uh, we, we promoted Chempre. Uh, we're in food, we have B2B businesses, but all, almost all our customers are consumer companies, so we're actually B2B2C. But nevertheless, we thought of ourselves as a manufacturing company. So we, we listed at 11 times PE. And we were content with that. Um, so lo and behold, the market really liked us. Um, we do work hard to explain to investors, but we're now trading at roughly 20 times PE. Um, I, I think we got something that we didn't expect. It, was a, it went a lot better than what we hoped. So, you know, I wouldn't want to jinx it. I think, uh, I don't think I'd want to change anything. Uh, for us, we, I think we did pretty, pretty fairly well. I don't think I would have really changed anything major. Maybe some minor things, maybe some housekeeping things, some, some little organization, that sort of thing, but nothing really major. I, I don't think I would have changed anything. The way we... We did it, the timing, it was, uh, I think overall, we're in a good position right now. You must understand, <clears throat> Ed, you might share this. There is a certain market peculiarity that they were able to list March or do an IPO in March <clears throat> and listed last day of March because they use the financial statements of September. If they had used Jan uh, December, they would have gone into June. So that's a market peculiarity that those of you who are contemplating of going public must be aware uh, is a limitation of the public. And we have, I think, through Phoenix, uh, Ed, uh, made already a request and it's standing with the SEC to allow the flexibility of that. Although there is certain flexibility that they will allow you to extend, but that's a peculiarity that everyone must know. Why is all the IPOs, uh, uh, what you call that, done June and onwards? Primarily because of that uh, peculiarity. Any on. other question? Ah, yes. There is yes. Uh, somebody here from uh, the media ah. whom I've known for yeah, 45 I'm, uh, years. I'm uh, somebody with no name. I'm, <laughs> I'm Tony. Tony Lopez of Business Asia. I would like to ask uh, each of the panelists, what is your greatest motivation in going public? Because being a family corporation or a family enterprise, you'll be motivated by greed. You don't want to share profits. So what is your greatest motivation? They say that if you go public, you have access to free money. Free money. Is that the motivation? Hi, Tony. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's part of my, uh, when I call. That, I'm uh, sorry I came very late. Yes. Uh, because Mr. C has a vision to be big. And I asked him, when can you accomplish that? He wants to be the biggest bank, the biggest property developer, and the biggest retail. When at that time, we have only two department stores and one, one uh, shopping mall and a small Acme Savings Bank. So I, can, I said, can you accomplish this in your lifetime? He said, how can we accomplish it? I said, we go public. We go public to use other people's money, not for free, because there is a price for that. Your commitment, your governance, and your sincerity to move forward long term. The major investors are long term players, hedge fund, etc. Short-term players, they don't stay that long, maybe five years. Long-term start they look at beyond the five years. So we must make sure that we have that entrepreneur spirit also to deliver so that we will do and we can do what we promise when we go IPO. That's why every year, as I said, we have the investor relation group here that goes around the world, at least once a year, not to raise funds, 
but to tell them what we are doing, where we are going, what's our plan, uh, what's their comment, etc. Pesos for every one peso net profit. That's the P-E ratio. For every peso that you earn, that you make profit, you get 38 pesos. That means you are overpriced. Overpriced if you are short-term player, but the other long-term player, they see future. As I said, our stock over the seven from the IPO went up by seven times. If you have invested one peso at the time of IPO, you are now seven pesos. So depend on how you look. That's why I suggested investors should define themselves. Are you a short-term player? Are you a long-term player? Because SM is a long-term player. No, they say our body is made to last 120 years. But worldwide, you are correct that the average is about 40% discount from that 120 years. <laughs> Was Sisi passed away at 96, which is a 20% senior citizen from that 120. So I ask you, Tony, how long do you plan to live? Maybe double 60 because you're now 60. Me, I want to live just like Sisi, 20 years. But it's not a question of how many years you are going to live. It's really a question of how many years of quality life you live on this earth. That matters. What's the use of you live 100 years old when you are always on the bed? This is study. 50% of how long you are going to live on this earth depends on our genes. If your father, mother died of heart attack at the age of 60, 50% chances is you will die of heart ailment at the age of 60. The other 50% is depends on how you live. The food that you take, the pressure that you hand, the way you handle the pressure. But the most important factor on that is how happy you are on this earth. If you are a happy person, if you are a religious person, without you knowing it, your system is just flowing easily. But you are not happy, your system... <laughs> over time, you have cancer, you have high blood, diabetes, all these things. So I wish that we could be number one happy. We are now one of the big good house to employ, according to, uh, I don't know what study is that. <laughs> I wish there ought to be one criteria, the happiest company to work with SM. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Xiao. Yeah, can we, can we get a quick uh, response yeah. from the, uh, uh, from Mam Lorraine and Sir Alvin for the same question? Yeah. Anything you can add up their happiness? Um, actually, for us, uh, one big motivator for listing, uh, it was simply fear. Let me explain that. Uh, so earlier, Lorraine and I had shared about that third generation curse. And uh, our, we kind of knew as a family uh, that we needed to do something different. If not, we would fall under the same curse. So uh, improving governance within the family, within the family business was the best thing we thought of doing. So we started with uh, ISO certification. We then uh, hired Pricewaterhouse as our auditor. Uh, we started hiring professionals who had worked with other companies to help us learn best practices. And then finally, um, doing the IPO, we felt, was another way to improve corporate governance within the business because as a solicited firm, you need to have transparency, independent directors, and so forth. Um, so that was actually our primary motivation. It wasn't so much access to capital. Uh, it was really how we could change and morph ourselves into a form that would survive the intergenerational. Realize that not everybody will want to work in the business and so going public forces us the same, having corporate governance and so also have an infrastructure or a structure where if you don't want to, there's exit, but if you want to, there's a way to go in. So it's, it's 
I think that's a good, that's an advantage for going public for us. Just not the clar money. Just a clarification of what Tony mentioned. It's not really when you go IPO, your proceeds is not really free money because you are not obligated. You have obligated. to pay dividends. Yeah. You have to pay dividends. And you and have that to comply with very onerous disclosure requirements. <laughs> no, but just the dividends. That is almost equivalent now to the cost of money. If you're paying 6% per annum annual dividend, that's already beyond above the cost of money. If you that's listen why to Joshio, he's paying much higher than cost of money. I know. Because he's selling happiness. <laughs> yeah, that one I cannot quantify. But uh, uh, Ed Francisco here is a BDO, will always buy any long term yielding paper better than 4%. Anyway, so at six, but, anyway but here is a third generation. Huh? Third, your third, who's you, your third you generation? Came to your third generation. Yeah, already. his third generation. Yeah, I yeah. know, I know his father. Oh. They used to work together. I know also his father. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they came to IPO very late, and it took courage for them to do an IPO. Oh, yeah in a very difficult environment, but I think they don't, they don't regret it. Dibabad? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're On, running right. short of time. But you we did not answer my question. We, we have, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so motivation for IPO. I mean, similar to what the guy, what, what Lorraine and Alvin said. At least for us, um, it was actually third generation led that this decision, we, we were actually convincing our chairman, which is uh, my father, to do it, um, for the simple reason that you know we we were always thinking about lost opportunity. What I what I mean by saying that is that every time we build a building, we were always expecting it's gonna take this long to lease it out. But it's always right before it finishes, it's fully leased out. It's happened three times already. We keep increasing the size of the buildings, and the way we funded it was that we would sell. Apart from debt, was we would sell land. And we always would say, oh, the land that we had in 2006 from, let's say, 30,000 pesos per square meter was in 2016 already at 250,000 250, pesos per square meter. So we're giving up that land appreciation just to build our recurring income projects. And that's why for us, we wanted to make sure that that land bank, which is very prime, you know, the three rules of real estate is always location, location, location. And we didn't want to give up that future land bank for our pipeline of projects to fund our present developments. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly, Sorry. because uh, where do you see your company 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Can I get a quick answer from? Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah uh, for us from Cibulan Masters, um, we really want to establish ourselves very strongly in the Visayas and Mindanao areas. Uh, as you know, there's so much potential for growth. It's a region that um, is, is still uh, underserved. And uh, that's why we went IPO, because we wanted to, to make our fellow Bismin um, uh, friends proud. Uh, and, and we believe in that region, and we're going to keep investing in that region. That's why I hope Sherfield can share their uh, inspire the many successful companies in Vismin. There are so many there who are uh, have the high potential for IPO. R right, right, sir Ed. And uh, so, so that's where we see Sibol and Masters um, uh, being very busy in that region. Thank you. Just, just a comment, maybe that's a cue for Evelyn and Francis Lim and Mr. Parong to maybe hold a Sharefield Summit in Cebu or Davao. Davao. For Wilcon, we feel that we want to be further intertwined in the Filipino in the Filipino life of when you want to renovate or build a home. We want to be present, not just physically, online, omnichannel, everywhere, all over the Philippines. That if you want to do something with your home or your space, you think of Wilcon and these are the ways you can reach us. So that's what we want. Thank you. Any other contributions? Well, Five years ago, when I met every investor, and they asked the same question, uh, where is SM going five years from now? That was five years ago. I say SM will be double at that time, will be double of what we are five years ago. And now we are more than double of what we are five years ago. Now, if you ask me the same question, I kind of, he stand to predict 
because word has now changed a lot. You have now technology coming in. As I said, we'll be unemployed five years from now. I don't know. Uh, you got uh, all this noise in the world, you know, fighting each other, each country fighting each other, trade wars, etc. Here in the Philippines, I don't know. Where are we going? You know, uh, we have now talking about changing uh, the form of government, etc. And it's untested. Uh, so, I would say we will maintain our growth with cautious. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just, just, uh, huh? We have too many questions suddenly. Uh, yeah, we'll just take two more questions. Uh, no, I understand it's raining outside, so my next meeting is seven. We can be here until six. <laughs> Cora? I have to ask this question. Can you please comment on the issue of gender equality in your organizations? I can see that except for Lorraine, we're only talking to gentlemen. Uh, is there any discrimination or do you have any active uh, role in ensuring that more women are given uh, the opportunity? I think, I think as a, well, Cora, you're a uh, director, so Banco de Oro, right? But the whole SM group, the whole SM group, we have almost 120,000 regular employees. You add the janitor, the guards, uh, all the things which are done by the agency, we are about 150,000. Believe it or not, 62% of that is female. So I don't know. Is that equality to you? No, maybe it's not equality, but it <laughs> 62% of our staff are ladies. Senior people, it goes down to 25%. This is natural because girls get married, they don't want more responsibility, etc. So that is something that maybe Sheffield could teach the lady members here how to be an active, more aggressive executive. But of course, family is always first. Thank you. Laura, Thank you. Um, yes, just quick. yeah. quickly. Quickly, um, how do you look at technology as an investment? Meaning to say, when it comes to the financial industry, there's already bitcoins and all that and other virtual currencies. So how do you look at this point of view in the next five to 10 years when it comes to technology? Thank you. Any, any one of you? Well, technology it has always been a part of our company's uh, investment strategy. We have a lot of IT investments. So we have our ERP, our e-commerce, I think it's, it's a part of who we are and how we operate. We cannot operate without technology. We have nationwide 44 stores. There's no way we can manage all of that without IT. So we're continuously investing in technology. Thank you. Um, for us, okay, um, so I'm an IT grad and I still keep up to date. In fact, uh, right now I'm actually, I actually just started learning to program in Python. I just started an online course, but anyway, um, I see technology as a very good tool to get where you want to go, but at the end of the day, that's all it is. It's just a tool. It's not the be-all and end-all. We have our own business goals and so forth, and we're just going to be a user of technology, and we'll continue to be That's the issue of opening up for the transparency. I could not share how we would have done our IPO differently because we were listed in September 1927. <laughs> one month after the Manila Stock Exchange was open. But in our case, the trigger was when we issued floating rate CDs in 1996 and 97, and the demands of the foreign banks for very detailed, especially the German banks, about very detailed information was the trigger, plus the initiation of the Standard & Poor's rating report. In other words, the IPO is not the only threshold event that will trigger that transparency. 
And the consequence of that is there are debates within your management team or within the family where certain areas are taboo or sensitive. But if you open up like that, it forces you, the market benchmarks you against this, and therefore we have to be transparent about this. How, what were those particular sensitive areas that were uh, too sensitive before opening up, and whether there were other trigger events prior to the IPO that started that opening up transparency process? It's for our generation, we just want it to be better. And that entails getting the information and getting the data to be able to actively change. So without that transparency that you would say, everything from our numbers, obviously in income, income some, um, having metrics to, to measure our performance, right? it's, it's hard to get better. You know, just, uh, I think just to marry this with the tech, tech question a while ago. So even like right now, we invested in a social software platform to see real-time information about our occupancies, all the deals that are happening within our buildings from office thesis. If I wanted to pull down what exactly my lessee is in the sixth floor of Asiana one, I can pull that down right now without having to check a contract or having to call you guys. And that's something that we see moving forward that we will be able to offer as a way for our investors to be able to get, to get transparent and accurate data about the company. Thank you. Just quickly. Yes. We're running late. <laughs> so please. No, go ahead. Please. Um, I think there are a lot of disclosures that investors will ask for exchanges will require. But at the end of the day, what makes a company tick and what I see, what, how we do things, how well we do things, these aren't disclosed in the disclosure. They're not financial numbers. They're not formulas. They're not our list of suppliers. It's much more than that. So. I'm not too worried about all of these disclosure requirements. At the end of the day, it's all a matter of compliance and everyone is doing it anyway. So there's no real loss of advantage, but uh, a lot of what makes a business really tick, that the co core comp competencies, these are the true secrets of what makes a company run. At the end of the day, these are still secrets you keep within yourself. Anyway, just quick answers. Can we get uh, from Ma'am Lorraine? Uh for our industry, we found that it's, there's really no secret. The biggest home improvement company is public. It's the Home Depot. And everything is listed and everything is uh, on their website. So there is no really secret for our industry. Uh, perhaps it could be our product offering, but then so do other companies in Asia, in the US. So there's really no secret. It's really a matter of how you deliver to the customer. And as Mr. CEO said, we have to be customer focused, and that's it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Joe. Well, I guess uh, there is that concern before we went into IPO, but over the years we have learned that there is no secret in business, especially in the Philippines, uh, <laughs> where cheese mist na lahat dito, but. Important thing is really as I mean, leadership. As long as you have a good leader in that corporation, it takes down to all the levels in the organization. If we have a leader who is not Mananakao, then the people down below will follow. But if you have a leader that's Mananakao, the people down below will also be Mananakao. Simply that. So we're not afraid. It's good to have competition. Thank you. Just one last. Yeah. Yes, so for, for us, the, the openness was easy because uh, of our founders' uh, values. No? The I in CLI is integrity. And I, play, I believe he, he, he brought that to company. And uh, all these requirements, he easily, he's an open book. And uh, even before we decided to IBO, I think five years before we decided to IPO, all our, we were audited by, the, by a top firm already. So it, it was an easy transition for us. Thank you. I think we have to end uh, the question. Uh, we have to thank all of you, first of all. Let's give them a big hand, please. Doctors, and I'd like to, to, to call in our chairperson, Ma'am Evelyn, and our president, Francis, to give the token of appreciation to our panel. Mom Evelyn, Francis.
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. May I have your attention again? As an appreciation of your for your significant role in the success of the 2018 Sherfield Summit, please accept this OAOK in sculpture from all here from all of us here at Sherfield. AOK. <laughs> Meticulously well dead by one of the country's most interesting sculptors, Mr. Hill Corquera. This sculptural piece is a beautiful combination of close and compact metal sheets forming a well-known hand gesture where the index finger connects to the thumb to create an open circle holding the rest of the finger straight and relaxed in the air. Generally, a symbol denoting approval and agreement Sherfield would like to give this three-dimensional art of peace to you as our way of saying a job well done and we gratefully recognize your significant contribution and support to our young organization. Once again, a grateful thank you and kudos. May you meet with more successes henceforth. Thank you, Ms. Kishin Jogan, uh, Ms. Mr. Lau, and Mr. Sho. Thank you also to Mr. Soberano, Wenceslao, and Mr. Ed Francisco, and of course to Mr. Kamba. May we ask our speakers and reactors to remain on stage for the photo op. 